live from digital address GA006-6714 at Desawe Kanda. This is Midday Live on TV3. Coming up in the bulletin, NPP and NDC agree on technical committee to fashion out working documents to deal with vigilantism. Peace Council Chair Professor Emmanuel Asante joins us in studio. Also, the West Africa Examinations Council, WAEC, denies report of leakage of examination papers in ongoing WASI. Also ahead in the bulletin, the Ghana Education Service reacts to inability to provide disabled WASI candidates the needed software to write maths paper. Elsewhere on the international front, U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton blames Iran for damage to oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman earlier this month. We've got details of all these stories plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. We're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with your views, comments and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. We are very active on social media. Our handle is TV3GH. My name is Pa Kwesi Asari. Let's begin with some politics now. And the New Patriotic Party, as well as the National Democratic Congress, together with the Peace Council, have agreed on a technical committee to fashion out a working document to deal with vigilantism. The committee is to be set up within four weeks. The stakeholders agreed to the setting up of a committee after lengthy discussion on how to disband vigilantism. A member of the National Peace Council, Dr. SKB Asante, stated the disbandment of vigilantism would be achieved. With the support of technical experts and with the inputs from the two political parties, we will present a working document on a roadmap for the consideration of the parties taken into account the reports submitted by the various stakeholders at the just ended dialogue on the eradication of political vigilantism. This will be done within a period of four weeks. Secondly, the draft code of conduct designed by the National Peace Council will be considered as one of the deliverables in the preparation of the roadmap. At the Mishot Commission hearing, political parties agreed that vigilantism thrived during by elections. But Dr. SKB Asante said it is an issue the technical committee will be considering. First, by our elections, to the extent that <clears throat> they provide evidence of vigilantism, they have provided evidence of vigilantism in the past, or the incidents of vigilantism, and we have discussed the <clears throat> role of violations in the general framework for eradicating vigilantism. Meanwhile, the two major political parties, the NPP and the NDC, have expressed strong commitments that vigilantism will not occur in the 2020 elections. They interacted with our correspondent, Daniel Opoku, at the Jess Ender Stakeholder Engagement on Vigilantism at Pediasi in the Eastern Region. General Secretary of the NPP, John Buedu, and the Chairman of the NDC, Samuel Fusampofu, were hopeful about the outcome of the meeting. We believe that if you look at most of this politically related violence. Uh, it's arising out of the organization of by-elections. And I think that for us, it does not also change dramatically the composition of parliament. So I think that we can look at it once more and maybe agree that any time any political party loses its member, either the party through its own internal process can present another candidate as, as the member of parliament. We are very much committed to this process and believe that uh, it's a threat to our uh, fledging uh, democracy and uh, we need to do everything possible to keep the progress on course. 
and will not allow the menace of vigilantism to undermine the gains that we have made so far. They also expressed confidence such groups will be disbanded before the next year's elections. That with the mere presence of the NDC, who are the major corporates in these things, they are the ones who didn't care so much about this political violence. It happened in their time, nothing was done about it over the years. We have taken it on board. With their even acceptance to be part of it and publicly agreeing to disband the hiring and the use of political vigilantism, it's, it's a way forward. And I believe that it will bring down the tension. We have shown real commitment to uh, the cause of fighting vigilantism. I would rather say that our opponent sometimes seems to be dragging their foot. Uh, this meeting has uh, degenerated to this time because of uh, some disagreement, because we felt that as political parties, we should be part of the process from the beginning to the end and that at every point of the engagement we should be seen to be making input. At the end of the day, we are the main practitioners and we are the main people who either suffer uh, or benefit from the use of these uh, vigilantes. Right, and joining us on Skype right now is Adam Bona, who is a security analyst. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Adam Bona, for your time and for joining us here on Midday Live. So this is about the third time the parties are meeting uh, on this matter. What's your own impression about the process so far? Thank you very much, and good afternoon to your listeners. I, I am taken aback. I mean, uh, until yesterday, I thought the Peace Council was making a lot of progress in, in you know, the menace, in stopping the menace of what you call that political party vigilantism. Uh, somewhere yesterday, uh, the news broke that a DC in the Krachi area, I'm sure the Krachi and Chumu area, had been locked out of his office. And as we speak, nobody has been arrested. And so it is hypocritical on the part of the Peace Council, on the part of the political parties who are involved. And probably, I was hoping to hear from the, the Parliamentary Select Committee on, uh, is it uh, the Constitution or whatever, those who are in charge, who are uh, trying to put together a bill, not to have made a statement of, uh, and actually insisted and impressed on the police to arrest these goons who belong to uh, the MPP. They are still working free. And so if we are spending the taxpayers' money to put together a, a committee or a peace council to dialogue, to bring about change with regards to violence in uh, political parties, and as the negotiations are going on, others take the laws into their own hands, and we still continue to discuss these things, I think it is a shame. And so as far as I'm concerned, as of yesterday, things were okay, but when this thing took place, I would say that it, ha it has eroded a lot of the gains they've made until such a time that these people who committed this atrocity are All right. brought to Mr. Bona, I'm going to ask you to hold on for me, Mr. Bona. Kindly hold on for me. I'll come back to you. I'm also be joined in the studio by the Chairman of the Peace Council, uh, Emmanuel Asante. He's here with me. Thank you very much, sir, for your time and for joining us on Midday Live. So you've just heard from the security analyst. He's quite disappointed that you didn't respond or say anything about the latest incident. The assumption is that the latest incident has been reported to us when we were dealing with these issues. So it hasn't been reported to you? Two, let me make it clear. He, as a security analyst, knows that trying to find solutions to such things is a process. We will not presume that the mere fact that we are talking and the mere fact that we are issuing this communique means that we have been able to eradicate anything. We haven't said that. We say that we are in a process of doing that. And I'm even surprised when he said that the Peace Council is, is hypocritical of Peace Council. Peace Council is only facilitating dialogue that will ensure that, you know, the, the menace of vigilantism is eliminated. So, I mean, I really do not see where the hypocritical thing comes in. Mm. We do not claim that we have been able to solve the problem. We are saying that we are in the process. And in fact, if you look at the communique that has been issued, the communique says that we are to, on the basis of the presentations that have been made, we are to come up with a roadmap right. that will enable us to ensure 
that these things do not happen. The right. police were there. Thank you. They have also brought their challenges right. and all that. Thank and we're you. going to take to that into consideration. I'll come back to you. Adam Bonner, so uh, don't you think you're just being overly critical of the Peace Council? They're just a facilitator. I'm not. In any no, case, I'm, in I'm any case being... let me go on to my next question. So the two parties together agreed uh, to come up with a technical committee uh, that will fashion out a, a, a working document to deal with this challenge of vigilantism. In all, your own views, what should this uh, encompass? Well, I, I want to, uh, good afternoon to the Peace Council Chair. Right. My point of the, all the parties involved, including the Parliamentary Select Committee on some of these things, referring, saying that it's, they have been hypocritical. I was expecting that as soon as this thing broke, I was happy when the dialogue started, and I thought that we had made a lot of inroads. But for this thing, it's happened, it's almost 24 hours, and I haven't really, there hasn't been any statement from uh, either the MPP, the NDC, the Peace Council itself, or from uh, members of those who belong to the committee in parliament about, you know, the fact that the political parties would have to be careful in the way they go about these things. And so now coming back to uh, some of the things I would want to say, I think that the roadmap should encompass some of these issues I'm, I'm alluding to, some of these issues I'm raising. The fact that we, some of us, I would want to see a situation where all the political parties would have to be cautioned to ensure that their party supporters would not take the laws into their own hands, either attack, what do you call it, a government officials who have been put there by government or call it appointees of the MPP government. The, the, the second thing would have to do with punitive measures. Should any of those parties involved uh, and involve themselves in this, the road, the roadmap should be able to say, this is what is going to happen. The third thing I would want to talk about would be probably uh, there has to be some amount of uh, duration. How long are we looking at ensuring that by which time uh, the maybe the first phase of the roadmap would have been adhered to, then we go into probably the other discussion. And so for me, these are some of the things I'm expecting to see in the roadmap. Uh, Adam Bona, I'd like to say a big thank you to you uh, for your time this afternoon. Adam Bona is a security analyst helping us to do some analysis uh, on vigilantism. Let me just go right now and uh, speak to the chairman of the Peace Council, Professor Imanel Asante, who's just joined us in the studio. He's been here for some time now. Thank you very much, sir, and good to have you in the studio. So what do you make of the process so far? So far, so good. We have had four meetings. The first two meetings were limited to the two political parties, the NDC and the MPP, MPP right. facilitated by the um, NPC, that is National Peace Council. Right. And we were able to come up with the communiques which got them to commit themselves to ensuring that, you know, vigilantism is not part of their political activities. That's violent vigilantism. The third meeting, which just we just ended yesterday, um, brought in other stakeholders, um, civil society, society organizations, the other political parties, political parties, mm -hmm. not all political parties, but civil society organizations, religious bodies, and the security agencies. The CDD had done a lot of research on vigilantism. They presented a very insightful paper. Mm. The police also came up to present a paper talking about the challenges that they face and others presented papers. The NDC also presented a paper, MPP presented a paper, religious bodies did that. At the end of the day, after deliberating on that, it became necessary for the Peace Council, the, the, the meeting agreed that the Peace Council should um, in consultation with technical experts and also the political parties, come up with a roadmap that will facilitate the implementation of the things that they've committed themselves to. What will the roadmap include? Obviously, I mean, the roadmap is to help, you know, the political parties to operationalize what they had committed themselves to, eradicating um, vigilantism, not engaging um, violent activities in the apolitical Quite, quite frankly, Professor Santi, okay. I mean, 
Do you honestly believe that vigilantism can be curtailed or disbanded? Nobody can tell you that violence in this world will be curtailed. But at least something can be done about that. You know, when you are dealing with issues of this nature, we always have to look at it from a, 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 a perspective of a, a process. It's not something that you could easily get up and say that I've disbanded that. In fact, they, we say in our tradition that Krobia Mensem Wom, even if you come up with the most solid, you know, laws that will prevent people from committing crime, you will still have people doing that. But at least you will be able to get people to agree mm -hmm. and to say that we are not going to engage these people in our activities. Mm -hmm. All the things that the expert that you, you, you just spoke to is saying are part of the things that will be considered mm -hmm. in the in the framework because the framework the papers that have been given touched on all those things so um, the peace council is an arbiter in all this trying to facilitate the process are you neutral why wouldn't we be neutral because Otherwise, because of peace council chairman uh, in a new circulating some time ago you the chairman of the peace council um, you know were reported by I mean, there were reports that the national chairman of the NDC had made certain comments about you. It has nothing to do with what we are doing. You don't hold anything against I him? I don't hold anything against him. And anybody who was there during Have you had a discussion with him The after? discussion saw us. We're not there. You know, it, it has nothing to do with personalities. Mm. Okay? Mm. And besides, the honorable... Fusu Ampofu. Fusu Ampofu. Right. You should have been there yesterday to see us chatting together, mm. discussing issues together amicably. I'm, I'm you don't care that. that he was reported to have said that his no, party no, 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 no. You. Whether he said or, or whatever they said doesn't really has nothing to do with the National Peace Council. Mm. Okay, mm. as far as I'm concerned, the National Peace Council is a national institution that is there to facilitate and broker peace mm. in in our country, mm. and that's precisely what we are seeking to do. Mm. So the roadmap, how 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 soon? Four weeks. Let me read, let me read the, 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 the thing to you, Please do. Um, if you permit me. Sure. Um, on the 27th and 28th of May 2019, this is the preamble leading to the mm. communique. Right. The National Peace Council facilitated a national dialogue which comprised of representatives of the National Democratic Congress, the New Patriotic Party, civil society organizations, religious organizations, and the security agencies to consider practical ways of eradicating political vigilantism in Ghana. The dialogue provided an expert overview of the nature, scope, and dangers of political vigilantism, mm -hmm. as well as a much needed forum for the stakeholders to present their perspectives on vigilantism and articulate the challenges they face in an attempt to contend with the phenomenon. Pursuant to the earlier communiques signed by the parties aimed at disbanding they are vigilante groups prohibiting the utilization of such groups and cooperating with state agencies and stakeholders to eliminate vigilantism in Ghana. The National Democratic Congress and the New Patriotic Party agreed that, one, the National Peace Council, with the support of technical experts and with input from the two political parties, will present a working document on a roadmap for the consideration of the parties, taking into account the reports submitted by the various stakeholders at the just-ended dialogue on the eradication of political vigilantism. This will be done within a period of four weeks. The draft code of conduct designed by the National Peace Council will be considered as one of the deliverables in the preparation of the roadmap. And the draft code of conduct mm. really talks about the things that parties need to commit themselves to right. to ensure that you know violent vigilantism or political violence is eradicated in right. this country. Right. I've got to say a big thank you to you. Thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you studio. very much. Uh, Professor Manuel Asante is the chairman of the National Peace Council. Now, three years ago, TV3 brought you the inspiring story of Matilda Agbenyaga, who defied the odds to write the basic education certificate examinations. Now, Matilda has made progress once again by partaking in this year's West Africa Senior High School Certificate Examinations. Unfortunately, a software has still not been developed to enable her answer complex exam questions, especially in mathematics. My colleague Portia Gabo has a rest of the story. 
Matilda Adanyaga has had an amazing journey despite living with cerebral palsy, a condition that affects muscle tone, movement and motor skills. When we first met Matilda, she was a candidate writing the 2016 Basic Education Certificate exams at the Medina Islamic Center. Because of her condition, Wayek granted her the permission to use a laptop to write the exams. Matilda, how was the paper? It was a bit difficult. Because of uh, her condition, she couldn't write mathematics. Because there is no any software that can help her identify the diagrams and then symbols that can help her work out all the other things. After BECE, TV3 followed up at Wayek, who assured they would work on providing a solution to enable students with special needs write exams with ease. Well, anything that the council can do to support special needs candidates will do that. So I think we'll take, we'll, we'll, we'll take that into consideration and see what we can do, which will not benefit only her but with other candidates in the future who have such needs. The Ghana Education Service promised to do the same. Matilda's case, she was not able to do past some of the mathematics mm. topics. So our division has also laced with the special coordinator and then other stakeholders. To deal with it. To deal with it, to get a specific and a special software for her. After the BEC, TV3 followed up at the computerized school selection and placement system and Matilda gained admission to the West Africa Senior High School. Three years on, Matilda has once again made inroads. She's partaking in the 2019 WASI, but with some challenges. Today, she's writing Core Maths Paper 2. This paper involves calculation. Unfortunately, Matilda cannot hold a pen due to her condition. After two hours, 30 minutes, Matilda is disappointed. She cannot write the paper. Matilda, how was the paper? It was okay, but me, because of the umbrella, did not provide me with the net. So, so it was a bit difficult for me, so I wasn't able to do it. I think ten, eh, because you need to illustrate a Venn diagram. That's why I could do not able to do it. During the BEC, we spoke with education service. They told us that to give us a, an IT specialist who will help her to who will help her install the a software in her computer. But up to now, nothing has been done. I'm disappointed in education service because a whole education service in this modern technology days that we speak about, there's no mechanism for physically child challenge people like this. So if they talk about all inclusive and they don't do anything about then their talking is not materialized or their talking is not useful. Is all right, so for those of you who watched the story three years ago, I'm sure you can readily identify with it. I've been joined in the studio by the uh, Director of Special Education Division of the Ghana Education Service, Amina Acha. Did I get that name right? Yes, or, yes. Right, Amina Ichan. Right, Ichan. And then Derek, uh, who is also a software developer. Yeah, head of tech era. Right. Thank you, Derek Omari, also for joining us. So I'll start off with you, uh, Amina. What happened? Why did the GS look on for this to happen? Thank you very much. Effort was made with regards to Matilda's uh, issue. As we promised that we will contact, have wider consultation of stakeholders to come in to support with the development of a software for her, especially for the mathematics. Uh, I contacted one Derek. He's a head of Tech Era, a company Is who he is the one you're talking just about? placed. Okay. He's the, in charge of uh, the head of that company, mm. they are developing software for students' uh, academic work. Mm. And he also uh, accepted the offer and started. Uh, we also needed funding, so the little that we could. He started, but because there wasn't enough funding, 
uh, he was in the process. And then when we realized that because of the time frame for Watsi, we also decided with him that we need to give Matilda some remedial uh, classes. So that remediation also took place in consultancy with the parents, the mother. So there it started with the other subject areas so that Matilda will be able to perform alongside with the mass. And to God's grace, she was able to start with the exams, with the other subject areas, with the core subjects and other subjects, with exception of the mathematics where because of the inability to complete the software. But it's the process. Derek hasn't stopped. He promised that he will continue and finish it. But he also needs some funding. So that Matilda shouldn't lose hope. It's the process academic learning. She will move to the next academic ladder. And that will be at the tertiary level. She can use it. And other students who also have special education and it's like cellular pulses. I'm going to come back to you later to answer some few questions. Derek, so you were helping her uh, by developing the software. What happened? All right, so we met um, at the Disability International Day for Disability. And we had a, a conversation about it, and that was when I heard about it, right, in 2018 in December. And so when it was brought to me, I spoke to the team, my team. This is the issue. And we have been working with persons with disability, thinking about how do we create technology for them to facilitate their learning, working with visually impaired persons, hearing impaired children, autism, and all that. And so when we, we actually, I met the mother, and I've been engaging with the mother for over four months. And I, we actually worked on a product, we worked on a product like that before, that allows children to learn maths without writing. But when we looked at the product, and we looked at Matilda's um, difficulty, we didn't think it was the best. So we actually need some funding to work on it. So we were thinking initially that product would work, but it wasn't the best suit, and we needed to do it, design thinking method that works for Matilda. Mm. And looking at the time frame, which was like three months to us, uh, WASI, we're like, okay, we have volunteers across the country. Let's create an academic assistance program that ensures that every week we have two volunteers that teach her how to answer questions with a laptop. Mm. And then we'll work with her psychologist, get the report, and try to get wired to wave off her writing maths because according to the mother, they've not really she's not really learned maths. Teachers never really include her because mm. they think she cannot write. Mm. So even if we develop the software for her, it's already too late for her to learn, and already she's not been doing anything in maths. Right. But so so uh, I mean, uh, so why didn't you just wave that off? Why did you allow her to write it? And that is also arrangement with WIAC mm. because there are rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, after this, we will also see Waiyek and see how best. We normally give time concession to children with special needs. Mm. So with Matilda's issue, we will also uh, link Liz with Waiyek and see how best we'll be able to help her. Because now she couldn't write. Absolutely. Just there's so, there's no basis to be, uh, to, there's no basis for any assessment on mathematics because yes. she couldn't write the paper. That is it. Mm. So we, from here, we will also talk to Wayek mm. and see how best to be able to uh, help her out. But mm. I believe she should be given the needed grades mm. because she will perform in the other subject areas Bad for mathematics. and move forward. Bad for mathematics. And as I also promised her mm. that she shouldn't lose hope. Right. She's already hopeful mm. that the software will be developed right. and she will use it right. for the next level of her transition to tertiary. All right, so beyond her, there are other people, I'm sure, you know, going into the future, would have cases like this, similar cases coming up. How soon are you moving on with the inclusive process to have everybody, you know, you know, dealt to everybody supported in this manner? There are a lot of interventions mm -hmm. put in place. Like, it's not only cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. children with autism, spectrum disorders, mm -hmm children with physical mobility, mm. hearing impairment, vision, they are there. Mm. So structures like with introduction of uh, development mm. of harmonized sign language, right. we've even launched. We are here to distribute and give training to our teachers and students so that Ghanaian students, not even children with hearing impairment alone, but all students, we can incorporate into the curriculum as we are reviewing. They will all learn 
study that harmonized or one common unified sign language. Right. The student will be able to communicate freely. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Amina Echa is the Director of Special Education Division of the Ghana Education Service. And thanks also to Derek Omari, uh, the software developer. Thank you, gentlemen and lady, for your time. You still watch and made live here on TV3. You're welcome to the business news segment here on Media Life on TV3. Now, data from the payment systems department of the Central Bank shows the use of checks as a means of payment declined in the first quarter of 2019. According to the E-Crimes Bureau, although the development is good for a cashless economy, users must be mindful of associated risk. According to data from the Central Bank, excluding in-house checks, the total number of checks cleared in the first three months of this year went down by nearly 121,000 compared to the same period in 2018, representing a more than 6.7% reduction. The value of checks transactions in the period under review also reduced by almost 5 billion Ghana cities, which represents more than 10% decline in transactions recorded during the same period in 2018. Mobile money usage is growing, with the volume of transactions for the first quarter of 2019 growing at over 39% compared to the same period last year. In terms of the value of all transactions conducted in the first quarter of this year, an amount of 66.4 billion Ghana cities was recorded as against the 52.4 billion Ghana cities done the same period last year. This represents a more than 26% growth. Mobile money services continue to grow with registered mobile money accounts showing an increase of 16.8% to 29.6 million as of end March 2019 compared with 25.3 million in the same period of 2018. The number of active mobile money accounts increased by 13.13% from 11.2 million in the first quarter of 2018 to 12.7 million in the first quarter of 2019. Well, so I'm sure this report doesn't come to you as any surprise. Uh, joining us in the studio is e-crimes and cybercrime analyst with the e-crimes bureau, Eric Mensa. Eric, thank you for your time. So what are the associated risks with the increased use of mobile money as a preferred means of payment? Okay. Now, um, good afternoon again to your uh, viewers. Mobile money has become the preferred choice and criminals are preying on key vulnerabilities uh, within the system. Key amongst them is the lack of security consciousness of uh, subscribers. And you realize that scams is one, counterfeiting. And then in terms of the institution, uh, target to, uh, on institutions, people or cyber criminals are targeting web portals and some integrations that uh, institutions do relative to mobile money transactions. Yeah, and so yes. who's supposed to limit or if you like reduce this risk? Is it the regulator? Uh, Everybody has a part to play. Mm. For example, uh, the regulator will have to set out uh, guidelines and regulations in terms of fraud management. For the telco point of view, uh, from e-crime, we, 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 uh, our, our, you know, we will have to really look at uh, security awareness, sensitization. Mm. So the telcos will have to uh, sensitize people on uh, cyber crime and then mobile money fraud cases. For example, we have dealt with MTN and MTN, we've worked with them in terms of fraud and uh, mobile money uh, sensitization with tel uh, the, the judiciary and then the police and even the um, journalists. All right, we've trained them. All right, Eric, I've got to say a big thank you to you. Eric um, yeah. is a cyber crime analyst with E-Crimes Bureau. Thank you, Eric Mensah, for your time. Right, so. Uh, that's all for the business news segment here on Midday Life. Let's return to uh, education and the West African Examinations Council, WAYEG, has denied reports of a leakage of examination papers in the ongoing West African Senior High School uh, examinations. While well, the council says it is, however, monitoring and investigating information regarding examination more practice in some examination halls on planned cheating patterns, prearranged cheating, and the smuggling of mobile phones to the examination hall. A statement issued by the Deputy Director in Charge of Public Affairs, Agnes Tay uh, Kujo, indicated that the Council has intensified uh, in vigilation examination centers. Uh, the Council has also withdrawn and annulled the appointment 
of some supervisors and investigators pending, invigilators, I beg your pardon, pending uh, further sanctions. YX said it has made a formal complaint to the Cyber Crime Unit of the Criminal Investigations Department of the Ghana Police Service on the operations of some rogue websites purportedly aiding in examination more practices. Right, you're still watching Media Live here on TV3. Now, a memorial service has been held for Major Maxwell Mahama, who was brutally murdered two years ago. There was also a wreath laying ceremony at the military cemetery where he was laid to rest. The memorial mass was solemn and brief. The gathering, few, and the message on forgiveness, straight to the point. The priest admonished the family to forgive the actors of the dreadful deed that took the life of a man who was serving his country. With tears streaming down their cheeks, the father, mother, brother, wife and some close associates were all gathered at a ceremony to commiserate with them. We pray that Lord you console them and when the questions are becoming too many, may you be their answers. Father, bless each and every one of those here this morning. And may they have this vacuum that has been created since the absence of Major Master Mahama. Be filled by you yourself, who is the true satisfaction of life. From the church, the family, friends and sympathizers went to the military cemetery for a wreath-laying ceremony. A grieving mother still struggles to come to terms that his son is no more. Reverend Father Campbell, delivering a sermonette, quoted John 11:25, and encouraged the family to remain steadfast and strong. We gathered together two years after the death of our dear son, and we commit him to God's loving care. And all we can do is to thank God for the gift of our faith. The faith tells us that Christ is our resurrection. Christ is our hope. In the Book of Wisdom, it says. You know, the souls of the just are in the hands of God. No torment shall touch them. But the souls of the just are in God's hands. That's our faith. And that's what we believe in. And that's our trust. That our soul of our dear Maxwell is in the hands of God. No torment shall touch him. The question, however, remains. Have we, as a country, learned anything from the unfortunate incident which cut short the life of a soldier? The tears of a mother, two years on, the tears keep rolling. Have we learned as a nation, have we learned anything from the unfortunate demise of Major Maxwell Mahama? We have laid him to rest, but our conscience is unable to rest because of events of the 29th of May 2017. We hope that as a nation this never happens again and we learn from it. Reporting from the cemetery, the military cemetery here in Osu. This is Martin Asiri Date. That's all for Media Life here on TV3. Thanks very much for making a date with us today. For more news, you can log on to our website, www.3news.com. My name is Parker Siasari.